jeez. Oh, that hurt. More than I thought it was going to. Hello, everybody. You know, throughout the world of both gaming and popular fiction, there are plenty of different yet typical character types. You got your hot-headed, hard-hitting fighters, the warriors what like to hit both fast and furiously, not unlike Vin Diesel. But then again, you got your spellcasting types too, right? Your wizards and warriors that may take a while to chant the incantations, but eventually come with a big fireball or something, and sometimes they can do status effects on enemies or cure status effects and heal allies. A true pacifier, not unlike Vin Diesel. And yeah, you've also got your stealthy rogues and your quick rangers and other classes like that, but one of my favorites has always been the humble red mage. They may not be as aggressive or powerful as the warriors are, and they're not able to cast the high-level spells that the white and black mages can, but they can do a little bit of everything, and that makes them one of the strongest classes in any game that they're in. And Magic has a deck that's a lot like the Red Mage. You got your aggro decks that try to kill you on turn 4 and devote every card slot in their deck to doing that by playing 1, 2, and 3 drops almost exclusively. And then you got your control decks that don't do a whole lot in the first few turns of the game but will kill you around the time you turn 80 or so. Of course, you've also got your combo decks that focus all of their efforts and energy on getting 2 or 3 cards into play that kill you all in one turn or in one time. However, Midrange is a deck building philosophy that lies somewhere in the space between, and unlike the Dave Matthews Band song of the same name, Midrange decks still hold up 20 years later. So today, let's take some time to learn about one of my personal favorite deck building philosophies on the market, what it is, and how to build it. Let's talk about... So I guess the first question to answer is what exactly is a mid-range deck? And I've already partly answered this question, but I don't think I've pinned it down exactly. It turns out that doing so is remarkably hard. I put this on the Patreon poll and all the patrons voted for it. It was by far the most popular option. And once I sat down with pen in hand to actually write this video out, or at least outline it, I realized, huh, this is a much deeper question than I initially anticipated. So the first thing I did was to set out reading how other people felt about the subject, and all of these articles here were not only integral in the formation of this video that you're watching right now, but also will be available in the description box for you to peruse yourself if you want some further reading on this subject once you're done. Now, first of all, maybe the most important thing to a good mid-range deck is the ability to beat just about any other kind of deck, be it aggro or control. Now they seem to do this by carrying about three categories above all else. Flexibility you could also say versatility, efficiency, and value. Now, flexibility will manifest itself in a number of ways, both in the removal package, the answers the deck chooses to play, and in the threats the deck chooses to play, and we'll go a little bit more in depth on those two things very soon. Now, the same is ultimately true of both efficiency and value, and of course, every Magic the Gathering deck wants to play cards that are efficient, but a mid-range deck wants to play cards that can do a lot of things while also being efficient. An aggro deck will play efficient creatures, obviously, but it usually sacrifices the ability for those cards to be, say, good when drawn in the late game. An aggro deck cares about efficient stats, which usually means low mana cost, relatively high stats, a high power to weight ratio, if you will, but sometimes those cards won't be great when drawn on turn 7 or 8. A control deck, on the other hand, likes cards like, say, Memory Deluge, that cost 4 mana to cast the first time, 7 mana to cast the second time, but are obviously very card positive in the advantage that they get you, but they're also quite slow cards, so you see how one end of the spectrum, the control end, sacrifices speed and mana value efficiency for impact of the card, whereas the aggro deck will sacrifice overall impact of the card, especially in the late game, for a fast, beefy, big body in the early game. Well, mid-range decks look at their efficiency a little bit differently. The cards that a mid-range deck chooses to play are often not as specialized say, as the cards that an aggro or a control deck will choose to play. A mid-range deck would much rather play cards that have the ability to do a lot of things and fill a lot of roles in different matchups. But next, let's talk about examples of some of the kinds of threats and answers that mid-range decks typically like to play. And to do that, we'll not only look at some examples from the mid-range decks of yore that have become legendary at this point in Magic the Gathering history, but some decks from today, too, if you're looking to build mid-range and standard, which is why I imagine a lot of people are watching this video. The format is right now more open to mid-range than it has been in a while, and there's not any one best mid-range deck like there has been in a couple of years past. So right now the format is very open 
to mid-range, and now's a good time to check out what these successful mid-range decks in the format are currently doing. But first, let's take a trip down memory lane for those that were there, and inform some of the people who weren't about some of the best Magic decks of all time. And to do that, let's first take a look at some of the kinds of threats that mid-range decks typically like to deploy. Now, first of all, with all of your card choices in a mid-range deck, you want some synergy, but you want your individual pieces to be strong, and that's more true of your threats than any other cards in the deck. Now, perhaps the most legendary mid-range deck of all time is The Rock, a green-black mid-range deck from somewhere around 15 to 20 years ago now, it's been quite some time, that used cards like Deranged Hermit and Phyrexian Plague Lord at the top end of its curve. Actually, it turns out The Rock was closer to 25 years ago. <laughs> time flies. But anyway, these two cards are a perfect example of cards that are great on their own when drawn individually. Both of these cards are very strong, but together they have some small amount of synergy, right? You can sacrifice these squirrel tokens to the Plague Lord to kill small creatures on your opponent's side of the board or maybe mess up combat math. But again, you draw either of these cards individually and they're very strong. They're also both very versatile and efficient for the time period pieces, right? The range Hermit is efficient in that it puts a lot of things on the board at the same time, and if your opponent kills your Hermit, you still got some squirrels. They kill a squirrel or two, you still got a couple of squirrels and your Hermit, so you're basically forcing a sweeper on them if they want to efficiently and effectively deal with this thing. So if they don't have that, they can't do that. Hermit also had the ability to be good no matter when you drew it. If you were ahead, then it was just getting even more ahead and putting a ton of bodies on the battlefield. Maybe you held it in your hand for in case you got swept, and then you got a board in a box ready to restabilize the next turn. If you were behind, you got a whole bunch of bodies on this thing that can block for you and get you back in the game. But again, in the case of Phyrexian Plague Lord, extremely versatile card, and again, for the time period, pretty efficient. 5 mana 4-4 four, four was not always something you could sneeze at, and in this case, if it didn't have the ability to go attacking for you, it could sacrifice and kill one of your opponent's creatures. It could do that at instant speed during combat. At instant speed during combat, you could sacrifice small guys, maybe get some value from that somehow, but kill your opponent's guys too. So both of these creatures were ways of killing an opponent while also catching up when behind. So that's all three of the principles that we talked about earlier innate to these two five drops. They are efficient, at least again, for the time period. They provide tons and tons of value, and they're extremely flexible. Other good examples of creatures that are at this point iconic to the mid-range archetype and still fill all three of those roles I was just talking about are creatures like Siege Rhino, which is a pile of decent stats for a relatively low cost, again, especially for the time period, against control decks, but also catches you back up against aggro decks and invalidates basically everything they do. The Scarab God is another great example of the kind of creature these decks are looking for. It's decently efficient in terms of stats for the mana cost, but it also allows you to grind out games, create attrition, and create too much value for the opponent to deal with over a long game. But you don't have to be a 4 or 5 drop creature to see play in mid-range decks. There are creatures that get bigger as the game goes on that makes them very efficient. For instance, a creature like Tarmogoyf, when you're only paying 2 mana for a 4, 5, or 5, 6 within a space of a couple of turns, then that's a pretty good investment and worth playing in most mid-range decks. The same thing is true of creatures like Scavenging Ooze, which have seen a lot of play in mid-range decks over the years. Bob, Dark Confidant, not that it can get bigger or anything, but it does provide a ton of value on decent stats in the early game and draws you a bunch of cards as the game goes on. So those are the kinds of early drops that mid-range decks are looking to play. We've already looked at the kind of late drops they like to. We see this manifested in various mid-range decks nowadays, with cards like Lolf, Planeswalkers by the way, very good in mid-range decks, we'll discuss that a little bit more in just a second, but Planeswalkers tend to be great, that's why cards like Lolf, that can both draw you cards and create board presence, tend to be great in mid-range piles. Same thing is true of the Wanderer, this is a removal spell that also creates board presence for you. A very versatile, flexible card both these Planeswalkers are, so you see a lot of it. Same thing's true of Wedding Announcement though, this is a card that grinds out value over multiple turns, can get you a lot of value before the opponent can deal with it, and sits on the table giving you an anthem effect for the rest of the game. That's a ton of value for a relatively low initial 3 mana investment, so these cards are perfect for nowadays mid-range decks, and you see a lot of them. But now let's take a look at the kind of answers that mid-range decks like to play. Again, you have to be pretty versatile in this category, and honestly I think this might be one of the reasons why we're seeing mid-range return 
in nowadays Magic the Gathering, standard on Arena and all that. We see a lot more mid-range because I think we've been given a lot of extremely flexible answers in this environment. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of answers in most mid-range decks. You've got your standard proactive answers that you're probably mostly familiar with, things like your Doom Blades and your Binding of the Old Gods, right? These are things that can either kill a wide variety of permanent types, like Binding, for a relatively high amount of mana at sorcery speed, or your Doom Blades that are incredibly efficient and only two mana at instant speed and can kill an extremely wide variety of creatures. But you've also got your proactive answers, which are often extremely important to your mid-range decks. In the past, you'd see cards like Thoughtseize be important to these decks, because obviously Thoughtseize is a good card. But you've also see Liliana of the Veil, another good example of a Planeswalker that's been important to mid-range decks in the past. But the ability to make your opponent discard cards turn after turn is obviously incredibly important to just about any deck that plays that card, but mid-range decks in specific. Hand Disruption is a time-honored tradition of the mid-range deck, and to this day we even see cards like Concealing Curtains occasionally being used in these standard mid-range decks. But, for the most part, we have such good and flexible answers in the current standard that you don't see as much Hand Disruption in mid-range decks currently. And we'll take a look at some of those decks momentarily. I wanted to look at two decks in specific that are performing really well in standard tournaments right now, and they're both tried and true mid-range decks. One, an Orzhov Tokens build with Planeswalkers, and the other, an Esper build. Now this Orzov list that we're looking at first here was piloted to a 4-0 finish at the Lotus Lookout by one Zachary Wyatt Plot, who's been playing the deck off and on for a while now here. And this is one of the better looking versions of this deck that I've seen. Now what we're going to do is move quickly through the individual card choices in this deck and talk about how they line up with the principles that we've been talking about so far in the video, right? Flexibility, versatility, and value. The Planeswalkers that we just mentioned a moment ago, Loth and the Wandering Emperor. These are both good at creating value. Even if your opponent deals with them, they may leave creatures behind. In terms of Loth, if your opponent deals with the creatures it creates, then those creatures then create more value in the form of loyalty counters. Meanwhile, Loth can also draw you cards, so if you're looking to find the right answer in a matchup, this can help you do that. But if the right answer is to put creatures on the board, this can do that too without having to draw them for you. The Wandering Emperor, kind of the same way. If you need a removal spell at any given time, this can give you that, but it can also give you creatures on the board. That's good if you're ahead and good if you're behind. Sword and the Mirthless can also provide you with card advantage, which is something a deck like this wants, but it can also create a lifelink creature to block when you're behind, or just a flying creature to get through for combat damage when that's what you need when you're already ahead. The deck also plays the full four of Luminarch Aspirant, which isn't always in the build, but you shouldn't be surprised to see. This is kind of the Tarmogoyf of our build, but dare I say, in a lot of ways, it's even more efficient than Tarmogoy. That's what we care most about. Again, this card is flexible because it can put counters on things other than itself. It's efficient because it only costs a couple of mana to get God knows how much in stats by the end of the day. And it obviously provides value for you over the course of the game. So all three of the principles we're looking for in a creature are present in Aspirant. The deck also plays three Graveyard Trespasser, a decent early to mid game creature. For only three mana, you get something that can be a 4 4, but comes with decent stats right out of the box. It messes around an opponent's graveyards, which is an important thing to be able to do, a thing that adds to the flexibility of the card, and the damage can really pile up as the game goes on. This thing attacking and gaining you life can also help win races. It crews the one vehicle in the deck. There's a lot of things for this card to do. Graveyard Trespasser goes the route of being difficult to remove. So again, pretty efficient in terms of stats for the mana cost, but also does a lot of different things. Sometimes makes the opponent discard cards, sometimes drains the opponent, sometimes deprives them of an important memory deluge in the graveyard. So again, a lot of things for this card to do in this deck. It also runs Enrica Domnathy as a two of. Again, something that you don't often see in these builds, but it's not hard to see why they played this card. It can provide card advantage, it can be a removal spell, or it can just be a big flying lifelink death touch body, which is pretty decent depending on whether you're ahead or behind some of the time. So Enrica is a great four drop that does a lot of things and can respond to just about any situation. Behind on cards you need an answer, draw a card. Behind on board state, make them sack a guy. There's a lot that Enrica can do. It's an extremely flexible creature that's good almost no matter when you draw it. 
The deck also plays two copies of Redain, which makes it a little bit harder for the opponent to cast their spells and makes any snow-covered stuff come into play tapped. Messing with opponent's game plans is often another big part of mid-range decks, and Redain does that very well. Elite Spellbinder is our hand disruption in this version of the deck, and again, it's not a card you see all the time. Sometimes you'll even see Concealing Curtains in this deck, but it's a little bit more common to see Spellbinder, especially in a format like this where there's a lot of five mana cards you have to be very wary of. So Elite Spellbinder fills the sort of thought seize role in this deck, but if you really want to look at it like a true mid-range player, in some ways Spellbinder's better than Thoughtseize because it can get through for three flying damage or block a flyer when need be. That all leads to an incredibly versatile card that has a lot of different roles in the deck. So of course Spellbinder goes in, it makes plenty of sense. One copy of Edgar Charmed Groom is also in the deck. Back when I talked about Graveyard Trespasser, I talked about creatures that are either difficult to remove or can come back from the graveyard time and time again. Edgar Charmed Groom is the other side of that coin. We've also got Legion Angel as a one-of. This does make us sacrifice some of our sideboard slots, but that's perfectly okay for a card that effectively always draws us a 4-3 flyer for 4 mana, which is a decently efficient stat line in and of itself. Just a 4 mana 4-3 flyer wouldn't be good enough, but a 4 mana 4-3 flyer that draws a 4 mana 4-3 flyer is incredibly efficient. The deck also plays Reckoner Bankbuster and plenty of things to crew it, but you're not going to be crewing this all the time. Sometimes it will help you recover from a sweeper, say, by allowing you to play a creature on your turn, immediately crew the Bankbuster, get in for four the turn after you get Doomscarred, and that's a pretty relevant thing for the card to do. It also makes its own creature, so it's kind of two bodies in one card. That's value, but obviously the best value off of this is the ability for it to draw you cards as the game goes on. Even though it only draws you a few cards, it's still just enough value at a low enough price that it's good in almost any mid-range deck in the format right now. The Furmat, the Format. A fur mat would feel really good on your feet, but I don't think I could support it. it. Seems cruel. But anyway, Wedding Announcement is also in this deck. I've also mentioned this card. This produces a lot of value over the course of a few turns, either up to three creatures or Really important for mid-range decks, this can also draw you cards. Up against control decks where you're trying to get a little bit more aggressive and get in for attacks and you're more able to do that because they're not playing as many creatures on the other side of the table, this can draw you cards and drawing you cards is very important in those control matchups. But against aggro matchups where you can't attack as profitably there, this will then put more board presence on the table for you. It just literally does everything, so it's very good for mid-range decks. This version of the deck plays both the Meat Hook Massacre and Path of Peril. Now, aside from all the various tokens that we play, the only thing we're actually blowing up with Path of Peril is Luminar Casperin. Unless, of course, we want to pay the six mana mode, which we can do in this deck when a sweeper is applicable. Both of these cards are actually very versatile for a number of reasons. Path of Peril is either a huge sweeper or a small sweeper that leaves all of our you know, Elite Spellbinders and Enrica Domnathis and Graveyard Trespassers on the table to attack. That's great, <laughs> so keep that in mind. But the Meat Hook Massacre is versatile too, because this can too, just like Path of Peril, kill all the small creatures, leave behind all our three and four toughness guys. We can also kill all of our tokens with this on purpose in the late game and drain our opponent out that way, which can be a good way of winning the game. The Meat Hook Massacre is a sweeper that provides incremental value turn after turn, especially in a deck that plays enough creatures to get that value, and we do. So the Meat Hook Massacre is arguably one of the most impactful and versatile and even efficient cards in our entire deck because it has so many modes. Aside from that, most of the rest of the deck is just cheap, efficient removal, like Blood Chief's Thirst is a one of, important to take out Planeswalkers, but also important to take out those small creatures in the aggro matchup. So Blood Chief's Thirst is in a uniquely decent position right now, despite the sorcery speed, but it can take out creature lands that may swing at you. A very important thing to do right now, so the deck also plays an Infernal Grasp, and perhaps the best removal spell in the format, three copies of Vanishing Verse. The deck even gets to play a removal spell in its mana base, Iganjo, Seat of the Empire, and it gets to play a grindy card in its mana base as well, Takenuma, the Abandoned Mire. It gets some of the absolute best creature lands in the format in the form of Hive of the Eye Tyrant, especially good creature land, and Cave of the Frost Dragon, which can fly over for damage in the late game, but Hive of the Eye Tyrant is good at messing around in opponent's graveyards, which can be good all the way up until the very late game right now. 
But next I want to take a quick look at Esper Midrange by Jarvis Moonbeam. This one went 6-2 at Stream League 9 recently, and this is quickly becoming the most popular build of the deck. Again, taking a quick look at this one, what jumps out at me the most is the versatility of the deck. Again, we see a couple of key planeswalkers here. The Wandering Emperor again, we've already discussed how versatile this card can be, but Kaito Shizuki is up there too. This provides you card advantage turn over turn while also creating creatures. That means it's good whether you're trying to find the right answer turn after turn, or you need to create blockers, or you need to create attackers, or a special ancillary mode on this is that you may want to create creatures for the purpose of sacrificing. That means when you combine Kaito and the Wandering Emperor, they appropriately function like best friends with Kaito drawing cards and creating creatures, and the Wandering Emperor removing creatures and creating creatures. They also do this very cool flavor thing I want to point out real quick where you play Kaito Shizuki and it phases out and then on your turn four it phases back in. You hold all your mana up after you play your land. Your opponent attacks into your Kaito and you play Wandering Emperor to take out the biggest thing attacking Kaito. It's very, again, in terms of flavor it'll make you cry every time but it's also a very good play line. Anywho, this deck also plays things like Legion Angel and Wedding Announcement and the Meat Hook Massacre and Vanishing Verse for all of the aforementioned reasons why you might want to do that, but it does have a few other sneaky cards that I want to talk about because I think they're incredibly important to the way a lot of mid-range decks function and for ways I haven't talked about. I should say for reasons that I haven't talked about, but things like both Eye Twitch and Spirited Companion are common cards to see in mid-range decks. Spirited Companion is the Elvis Visionary of this format. This is something you can throw down that can either attack, maybe it can get some sort of anthem effect and attack for two or three, maybe it can get counters from something like the Wandering Emperor, so it can be an attacking body, but most often it's going to be a blocking body that draws you into more answers, and for two mana that is extremely efficient. The same thing is true of Eye Twitch. This is a one mana creature that effectively draws you a card. And in this deck, there's plenty of ways to make it do that without blocking, but of course, you can just block with it to draw the card. It blocks everything in the format. Incredibly important this thing flies. It's extremely efficient in only one mana. It, ev it eventually draws you a card, and that card could do everything from get you another land and gain you some life to putting a bunch of creatures on the table. So I Twitch, uh, incredibly, again, versatile and efficient card in the format right now, and it's not surprising to see so many copies of this, but it's also not surprising to see copies of Shambling Gas. Now, unlike Spirited Companion and Eye Twitch, this isn't going to provide you card advantage at any point in the game, but, well, unless you sack into Deadly Dispute, which is in the deck, but what this will do is provide you a little bit of ramp while also being a blocker. This is something that is incredibly important to a lot of mid-range decks of the past, right? The Rock, even, and decks like the Loxodon Smiter, Selesnya, and Abzan decks would always play Birds of Paradise in the one-drop slot. That's because Birds of Paradise is incredibly efficient, it ramps you by one turn, and it's a decent flying blocker late in the game. And I think Shambling Ghast is the spiritual successor in mid-range decks nowadays to a card like Bop or Lawn or Elves, right? Because this is also a ramp piece that can also jump in front of something in the early game to make sure that aggro is not just murdering you, right? This can also kill small creatures in aggro, but everyone that's played with Shambling Ghast knows that what, seven times out of ten at the very least, this is going to make you the treasure token, and often that little bump in mana production is incredibly important to a mid-range deck, whether it's Birds of Paradise 25 years ago or Shambling Gas now. There's also Rite of Oblivion, though, the last card that I want to look at in the main deck that's not a land, at least. Rite of Oblivion is key to this build of the deck right now, and there's a reason that I saved it for last. Of all of the mid-range, in big air quotes, cards in this deck, I think this might be one of the best examples. It's incredibly efficient at only two mana to cast the first time around. It's also a form of card advantage, even though you have to sacrifice creatures. It still has flashback. Mid-range decks really, really like to be able to play stuff out of their graveyard or play a card a second time. That increases value and efficiency stats. <laughs> but also, this is incredibly versatile. It really lives up to all three principles. No matter what you sacrifice, you get to target anything in the world. So whether you need to take out a planeswalker, a creature, an artifact, or an enchantment, this lets you target just about anything that might be ailing you at any given time. And that's an incredibly important thing for a mid-range deck to have access to. 
Now, both of these decks are, I think, great examples of mid-range decks in the current environment, but they're not the only mid-range decks viable in the current environment. I'll take it back to Couch Dev. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a mid-range deck. The ability to go above the aggro decks and underneath the control decks. A lot of your good stuff decks, your three color Abzan good stuff decks are mostly going to be mid-range decks. Hell, the first deck you built when you started playing Magic the Gathering, it was red, black, had a lot of removal in it and big like four and five drop creatures that fly and have big fat power and toughness. You got your lightning bolts and your terrors and doom blades and stuff. That is your typical mid-range deck. This has been a deck that's been around since the very beginning of time, and as a matter of fact, when you really think about it, mid-range may be the oldest archetype. Again, the Lightning Bolt plus Terror plus Singer Vampire plus Shivan Dragon deck is as old as Magic itself, and it's a time-honored tradition. And I like that now, even over a quarter of a century later, that kind of deck is still viable. And honestly, even more so now than it has been in a while. I mean, standard environments have the ability and the tendency to coalesce around the best mid-range deck, and that leaves all the other mid-range decks out. And I hope that's not happening as quickly this time around. And even though there is some evidence to say that the Orzov and Esper decks that we looked at in this video are kind of taking over the mid-range role in this format, I think there's still plenty of room for experimentation when it comes to mid-range. There's a lot of stones left to be unturned that tend to work when you actually look into them. Things like Brilliant Restoration, or the Dragon Kami Reborn, or Abzan Vehicles. There's tons and tons of stuff you can do in this format right now, and to be honest, Kind of refreshing after getting a few formats in a row where there's only really one viable mid-range deck, if any at all. But that's all I got for this one. The next video that I want to do is the top 10 forgotten cards to try in Kamigawa Standard. Now I'm pretty sure we're going to end up talking about a lot of flexible, efficient, and value-driven cards that you may not have looked at in a while. Mid-range cards for lack of a better term. So check that one out next. And if you want a cool video to watch that not enough people watched, I think, check out this almost hour and a half long extended deck tech with awesome gameplay on the mono colorless Voltron deck with Mech Titan Core. That was a good one. But for now, that's all I got. So if you liked it, like it, share it around if you would do that with me. And if you want more content like this and other content not like this, I do all kinds of stuff. I'm a mid-range player. I'm very flexible. Make sure you sub to the channel. But that's it for this one, my fellow red mages. So I will leave you be. Just let me know in the comment section how you felt about this one. I am Dev from the Place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.